I'm Larkin McCormack and I'm the paleontology preparator here at the Museum of Northern Arizona. Right here we're on the research campus side of the museum, um, so we're across the street from the exhibits building and we're in the Brady Geology building. Um, and so I'm going to be taking you on a little tour today through our paleontology collections and our fossil preparation lab. Um, so you can follow me in this way to the collections and I'll show you some of what we have. The way our collections is organized is that we have our um, youngest specimens here at this end of the museum and as you move further back in the collections it gets older. Um, and so what we're looking at in this case here is one of our oversized shelves um, that has some of our Pleistocene fossils in it. And so um, on this top shelf here we have a giant ground sloth jaw and the top part of the skull is on display in our exhibits building if you're interested in seeing that. Um, and then on this bottom shelf, we have a bison skull um, and the back part of the skull is missing, but we have both the horns here. Um, and we also have a mammoth jaw on this part of the shelf here. Um, and so this jaw kind of represents some of the Pleistocene megafauna that would have been in um, this area of the country during that time period. Now we're gonna move farther back in time in the collections to the Cretaceous period. Okay, so here we are um, further back in our collections and you can see some of our museum cabinets here. These are our older cabinets um, and we're in the middle of an Institute of Museum and Library Services grant right now where we just purchased a bunch of new cabinets um, within the last year and a half. And so these are our nice new Delta design cases that we're upgrading our storage condition of our fossils in. So in this cabinet here, we have a dinosaur that's called Penaceratops. And so it's related to a dinosaur that um, you guys have probably heard of, Triceratops. Um, and so it's one of these dinosaurs that has these horns and then a big frill coming back behind the head. And it's called Penaceratops because it has five horns rather than three like the Triceratops that has two extra cheek horns as well. Um, and we have most of the skull preserved here, but it's in a number of different pieces. Um, so in this top drawer here, we're looking at the front part of the skull. This is the beak here that would have been used to clip vegetation that this animal would have ate. In this drawer here, this is the whole back part of the skull in the brain case. Um, and this ball at the back is called the occipital condyle. And this ball would have connected the skull to the base of the spinal, um, base of the vertebrae. And uh, it's kind of amazing to me that this ball supported this whole huge massive skull of this animal. And then as we move further down, um, we have a bunch of pieces of the frill back here um, that would have come back behind the head. And then in this bottom drawer, we have one of the lower jaws. Um, and this is one of the ways that we tell this animal was an herbivore. Um, and so if you look at the teeth here, they're leaf shaped. Um, they're not like knife-like or serrated as we'll see in some of the carnivorous dinosaurs. Um, and if you look at the inside surface, um, the teeth from the upper jaw would grind against this and creating this really flat wear surface um, so they could just be really efficient grinders of vegetation. Um, this dinosaur, it's from the San Juan Basin of New Mexico and it's about 75 million years old. Um, and yeah, it's just a really beautifully preserved specimen. Hopefully one day we'll have this specimen on display in the exhibits building for you guys to view as well. So this is our Desmatosuchus skeleton. Um, like I said, it's a type of Aedosaur, so it's not actually a dinosaur, but it's a reptile that was alive at the same time as dinosaurs. Um, and so this fossil was found on the Navajo Nation by a teacher. And the first bone that was found was this one right here. And it's the, um, actually the shoulder spike of this animal. Um, so if you look at this image, it's this big shoulder spike. And 
When it was originally found, the woman thought that it might have been a bison horn, which you can see by looking at it how she would think that. Um, but once the paleontologist came out and looked at it and realized it was in Triassic rocks um, and found more of the skeleton, they realized that it was this Desmatosuchus animal. Um, and so this animal would also have been an herbivore, and it would have been covered in these armor plates. Um, so it would have had these spike-like plates, the lateral plates, all along the sides of the body. Um, and then it also would have had these more flat plates, um, the medial plates, covering the whole center body, part of the body. So this thing literally was built like a tank. Um, and this was because there were all sorts of predators in this time that would have been wanting to eat it. Um, and so it was just trying to protect itself. And a lot of these bones here, it kind of just looks like a mass. And you can see that they're uh, fused together by iron, which is common in some of our uh, Triassic fossils from the Chinle formation. And so we have just massive amounts of um, these armor plates preserved. And then we also have vertebrae of this animal preserved. So these are some um, articulated uh, anterior caudal vertebrae, so just at the beginning of the tail of this animal. Um, and you can just tell from how robust these are, just how massive of an animal it would have been. Now we're going to move on to some of our fossil holotypes. So I'll explain what those are to you and show you some cool fossils. So here we are at one of our holotype cabinets. Um, what holotypes are, for those of you that don't know, is when you name a new species, you would designate a type specimen um, to serve as the representative for that species. And so they're really important because any other time um, someone's working with a fossil that they think may belong to the same species, um, they'll come and compare it to the holotype to figure out if it has the same anatomy. Um, and so what we have in this cabinet is plesiosaur fossils. And plesiosaurs were marine reptiles living at the time of dinosaurs. And they actually, these ones, um, lived in the western interior seaway that used to come down and divide North America into two land masses. Um, and so these ones are from present day southern Utah. Um, and we'll open up some of these drawers here. And I love these fossils right here. These are, this is a front paddle and this is a hind paddle of a plesiosaur. And um, the way that they're cradled, this is exactly how they are found in the field. So they are found um, completely articulated just together like that, which is pretty rare. Um, usually you'll kind of find the bones just scattered around and you might not be positive exactly how they went together. If we move a little bit farther down, this is another plesiosaur. Um, we have the lower jaw in the skull here. And then on this side, we have a bunch of what are called gastroliths. And so these are stones, and they were all found in the stomach region of this animal. Um, and it's thought that they would have um, swallowed these stones, and they would have uh, kind of helped to digest food, so help to move around and grind up and digest food. And so we have tons and tons of these that they were all uh, numbered when they were collected in the exact positions that they were in. Um, a couple more things that we have down, down here. We have some paddles um, of the same animal as that skull and a bunch of the vertebrae as well. Um, and so all of these fossils were recently rehoused as a part of our grant. Um, so myself and our volunteers have just spent hours and hours um, working on updating the conditions for these fossils so that they're preserved in our collections as well as possible. So we'll move on from here, um, and I'll show you around our fossil preparation lab. So welcome to our fossil preparation lab. Um, the purpose of this lab is that fossils come in here um, right when they're removed from the field. And when we remove fossils from the field, they're still covered in a bunch of rock. We bring that all back with us, and then we um, have to use more delicate tools back in the lab to reveal the fossils so that they can be studied by researchers and also put on display in the museum. And so I have some of my tools out here to show you. Um, this is just a paintbrush um, and I have them in various different sizes. And so I'll use this to brush away 
the more loose matrix, um, kind of like in Jurassic Park or something, but <laughs> it usually isn't quite that easy. Um, and we have a variety of other tools that we use. Um, so this is a dental tool here, uh, just exactly what, what they would use on you at the dentist to clean your teeth. Um, and this works really well for us to remove um, softer rock that's around our fossils um, and get down to uh, where the fossils are, clearing them off. Tweezers are always helpful also um, to, if you're working on something smaller, to pick up some smaller pieces and you can use them to fit pieces back together. And then this last tool is called a pin vise. And this is one of my favorite tools. What it is, is a carbide needle tip um, that you can sharpen to however you want it to be, whether it's a chisel tip or a point for different jobs. Um, and I use these when I'm working right at the surface of the bone. And you really do go very slowly, just removing several grains of sand at a time um, or little pieces of mud or whatever it is. Um, and usually when I use pin vices, I also work under a microscope. So I would just put my fossil right down here and then looking through the microscope, it would magnify it way bigger so I can be just um, very precise with what I'm doing and make sure that I don't injure the fossil at all while I'm removing the rock from it. The last thing that's really important in fossil preparation are glues. So when your fossils come out of the ground, oftentimes they're really fragile. Um, and so I use a type of glue that's called B72 Paraloid. And what this is, is it's a resin that's dissolved in acetone. Um, so acetone is um, sometimes what you use as nail polish remover, um, and it's used in other applications as well. But it works really well because this glue dissolves in it. And then when you place the glue on the fossil, the acetone will evaporate, and then the glue will be left behind to bond the fossil together. And so I use a thick for gluing two pieces together, and I have a thinner consistency as well that you can See, it's not quite as thick there. Um, and I'll use this if a fossil is just really friable and fragmenting apart. Um, you can kind of just apply the consolidant all over it and it'll help strengthen your fossil. So one thing that we have to do a lot of as preparators is fitting fossils together. Um, so they're basically like big 3D puzzles that um, you have to figure out how they fit. And it's definitely always satisfying when you get that perfect fit where they come together. Um, and so I have a bunch of different fragments here and larger fragments um, that fit back onto this piece that I'm currently working on. And so what this is, is this is the pelvis of that same animal, the Dismatosuchus, um, the one with the big shoulder spike that we looked at in the collections. This is its pelvis here. And I'm assembling it and then going to glue it all back together um, eventually so it'll be one piece in our collections. So what we're looking at here is um, a partial skeleton of a tyrannosaur. Um, and so I'll show you a couple of the coolest pieces first. This is the big maxilla of this dinosaur. And so this animal isn't actually T-Rex, um, but it's an ancestor of it, and it's named Bista Hiverser, also from the San Juan Basin of New Mexico, the same area that that Penaceratops is from. Um, and this skull right here belongs to a juvenile. Um, and so here's the teeth on the lower jaw, and it's also disarticulated. It's in a bunch of different pieces. Um, and then these bones over here belong to the hind limb of the animal. And I've been working on these in the lab, making cradles for them. So if you see this white underneath here, this is actually fiberglass, um, strips of fiberglass that I've dipped into plaster and then covered um, the specimen with. And uh, this allows us to just perfectly conform the support to the shape of the fossil so that it's less likely to break under its own weight in the future. And I have these um, fiberglass and plaster cradles lined with ethafoam. So they have this thin foam liner that cushions the specimens as well. Each of these are custom made and they're one of the more time consuming um, rehousing efforts, but these will protect the fossils and support them for many years to come. And so this one I was just showing here is the femur. And then we also have the tibia next to it. And then um, these are some bones of the 
feet, the metatarsals as well. Um, and so this specimen is a juvenile. Um, it's smaller than typical for tyrannosaurs, and there are larger specimens of the same species as well at the New Mexico Museum. So these fossils here are in their final state now and ready to be moved back into the collections. And if you follow me over this way, um, I'll show you a block of fossils that's partially prepared. So here we have this massive block of fossils from Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. And um, this kind of shows what a block is like when you're in the process of removing the rock. So we bring a bunch of the rock back with us into the lab because it really helps support the fossils while they're in transport. And so what we do is we create a layer of plaster and burlap around the fossils. Um, and you plaster and burlap all around it, um, and eventually it'll be fully encased. And this is what we call a field jacket. And when you bring that back to the lab, um, you use different hand tools and open it up. Um, and the side that we're looking at in this jacket right here is actually the side that was on the bottom in the field. Um, and so it's been partially prepared. You can see how this level is lower here. Um, and this lower level has some full skeletons exposed that have been revealed by a preparator. And so what is in this block are dinosaurs called coelophysis. There's an image right back here that shows a reconstruction of what these animals would have looked like. And so they were really small dinosaurs, some of the first dinosaurs um, that would have only been about this tall. And we have some really complete skeletons from this site. Um, it's a really unique site where there's just thousands and thousands of these animals. Um, and there's blocks like this at a variety of different natural history museums around the US. Um, and it's just really rare to find so many animals in a deposit like this. And so what uh, paleontologists think happened was that there was a massive flood that um, killed these animals and preserved them all together. And so if we take a close look at what's going on in this jacket here, um, there's, first I'll just point out this one dinosaur skull to you right here. It has all these tiny but really sharp serrated teeth showing you that these were carnivorous dinosaurs. Um, and then there's one other complete skeleton that I'll kind of walk you through so you can see it. Um, and so we'll start at the tip of the tail here. And these are just all the tail vertebrae. We come around to the hip right here. And then we've got both of the hind limbs coming off of that. You can see a bunch of little toes here and here and the claws. I just love the toe bones. I think they're so cute. Um, and then if we continue back from our hip, now we have the vertebrae of the neck and that curves all the way around. And then we have the little skull right here of this animal. So yeah, we just really have this excellent preservation at the site and it's just a really great window into what these Triassic dinosaurs would have been like. That's all I have for you guys today. I hope that you enjoyed the tour of the paleontology prep lab and collections. Um, and I hope that in the future, you guys can come and visit us here. Thank you.